Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been a great conversation so far. Let's go over the camera. Um, so I'm Dan Bruce with the Pet Care Innovation Prize. Thanks for being here. Uh, some of you are watching online and some of you will see this video after the fact. Uh, but for those of you that are joining us here at Central in Chicago today, uh, thanks for being with us. Um, so first of all, I just want to kind of tell you what's going to happen here tonight and then, uh, and then we'll get started. So the idea of the Pet Care Innovation Prize um, is a prize that we do to help bring pet care entrepreneurs together, get them some cash, some business support, and help them a lot. It's all about building kind of a community, so we're trying to make sure that this is about the pet care entrepreneurship community here in Chicago, which we found has been really strong. In fact, of the 10 winners so far at the Pet Care Innovation Prize, five of them have uh, Chicago DNA, so you guys are definitely, you guys definitely over index as far as pet care companies, uh, from our perspective. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is we have uh, six startups, uh, founders of startups that are going to come and they're going to tell you just a little bit about what they're doing. Um, and then we've got a group of panelists that have a lot of expertise either in the industry or in growing businesses and, and uh, helping companies get from where these startups are to where their potential is. And so we're going to have the conversation all about that. On your chair, there's our index cards. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask anybody, um, we're going to ask that you just write it on an index card and raise your hand. And, uh, is Gabe here? Gabe is, Gabe is wearing the, the she's got the chartreuse head scarf on it. So if you give her your card, she'll pass it up to me. Make sure your question gets asked, okay? So um, thanks a lot to Centro for hosting us. You're going to hear just a little bit about Centro in a second, but we want to get started. And we're going to go through our startups that hopefully everybody's met, uh, and they're just arranged alphabetically. So we're going to start with Alan, with really a pet. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Alan Cook. Uh, I'm the creator of Brilliant Pet, which is the world's first automatic self-cleaning puppy pad for small dogs. We focus on small dogs because they're the biggest and fastest growing segment in the dog population, and they go through billions of puppy pads every year. But if you've ever handled the soiled puppy pad, you know they are disgusting. They are messy, smelly, and gross. So we created Brilliant Pad, so you never have to handle a dirty pad ever again. We started product sales about a year ago. Uh, we've generated over a million dollars in revenue. Uh, and we're here tonight developing uh, partnerships that help us with our direct-to-consumer uh, marketing channel. Great. Thanks, Al. Excitingly, we're a distributor for that Australian manufacturer. 
We're also building a brand called Mud Jackson because our motto is just love. We believe that people become better when we're around dogs. We're trying to find locations like Montrose Dog Beach across the entire country to build more, more locations and install more canine thousands and allow us to be better. We're looking for places that we can sell canine thousands to, whether they be car washes, pet retail chains, uh, mom and pop stores. Come to us if you're interested in canine thousands. We also want to know more about unicorn locations where we can build more much access and eventually franchise this awesome company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. companies, 
I'm on the board of a couple of companies, and we also have and manufacture our own products that are patented and we sell them worldwide. So um, I have to say I agree. The pet industry is going direct to consumer. The internet has taken it over. Uh, old timers like myself are trying to figure it out, but you young people, I think, have figured it out already, and I hope you keep going down that path.
Um, first thing I'm going to start uh, with uh, with Sean and uh, uh, lots of people have already said direct to consumer. And can you tell us a little bit about when you see it from a marketing, uh, you know, from your perspective, what does the direct to consumer mean that's different than how people went to market for CPG companies, for consumer packaged goods companies, not just in bed? How has that changed? Um, well, I think the, the disruption and transformation going on today in direct to consumer is huge. This industry, the whole industry, the, the CPG industry has been dominated by the big brands you know, for decades overall because there's never been a path we didn't have huge marketing budgets to actually reach consumers. The world has changed today. The ability for you guys to understand how to market and advertise your brands and your company and your products, you know, with very small budgets, whether it's through search, whether it's through social, um, that's transformed and really allowed small businesses to be able to operate a lot more efficiently than they ever have. But I'll back up one thing and just a, a quick tidbit um, on Centro. So I, like many of you guys, you know, I started the company when I was 29 years old. Um, I didn't have any capital. No one was going to give me capital. It was the end of 2001, right after 9-11. So I only had one choice, which was to you know, work my ass off and bootstrap the thing. And I did that for four to five years before I even got you know, my first $2 million round of uh, mutual funding. Um, every, com every employee who comes to Centro gets a book, and it's called Raving Fans when they start. And the idea is that creating satisfied customers in the world isn't good enough. Um, you have to create raving fans. And I believe, especially in the startup B2C world today, you know, those forming that one-to-one -one relationship, getting data on your customers, understanding who those customers are, and leveraging that audience to be your microphone or your, 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 your promotional items is going to be the best thing. That word of mouth traffic is so critical. You know, they say in the world that if you have a bad experience, you tell seven people who Great experience to talk to great people. We try to flip that at Centro. Our clients are our number one advocates and our goal is to be really fans. So I just want to say before you even think about all the marketing and really cool targeting and stuff you can do, don't discount CRM, getting a lot of data on your customers and really trying to leverage them as your as your piece, get them to start sharing wherever they can. It's free publicity and that's where I would begin. Thanks, Charles. That's great to you. I'm gonna ask the, the three in the center here who have been uh, Founders of the pet care industry. So, talk a little bit about that idea of raving fans. So, what did that look like to you? And then, who of the startups that you talked to tonight? What did you see that where they really kind of got the secret sauce of maybe something kind of really compelling about getting to uh, people to get people really excited about what they're doing? David, would you start? So, uh, actually, Sean said something I think really interesting, which is when you do something that you love and you feel passionate about. The raving fans, there's an organic component to that, that raving fan concept. Um, so I've always um, been building my companies. I love, I've always loved what I do. I've always loved my customers. I've always loved our mission. I've always loved our, our delivery. I've always loved all of that stuff. So um, when I actually have to put my kind of thinking cap on around it to be more intentional, the way that um, Sean's speaking to, it's a fascinating journey that I would definitely um, encourage everyone to take. There's, there is that kind of dichotomy between what drives you and then uh, applying that to grow the company and grow that, that fanship. Um, and then also, what, is the, what are the intentional things around it, like working with a company like Centro or you know, whatever growth hacking you're going to do. So I guess you know, for me, it's really a little bit of both. It's the organic love, and then it's also just being really mindful and smart about how you're going to hack your way um, to to scale with with a group of customers who, who want to see you succeed because your success is also their success. Did you, did you see one of the startups that you thought kind of that they said something that resonated with your heart? Yeah, I mean, you want Jackson, Paul, or are you? Where's Paul? Hey, Paul. Um, <laughs> back by the bar. Sorry. <laughs> nice to meet you. Oh, it's over there. Um, so Mutt Jackson, I feel like every time I've seen Paul speak or I've heard him talk about Mutt Jackson, he's always talking about, he uses the word third place um, in talking about his brand and what his hopes are. And I feel like that is really that concept of always thinking about how to make the experience right and always keeping your customer's experience as the most important driving force for all the decisions you make. So I think that Paul's nailed it around that and continues to. Thanks. Yeah. David um, So I guess for me, um, it's always been about doing what's right 
having integrity. Um, people feel that, people get it. When we started the Zeus and we had brands, our customers were the retailers. And because we took care of them, we brought innovative products to them. Anytime someone went into a retailer, like you entrepreneurs would walk into a retailer and say, hey, I have this product. Guess what? I would say 99% of those retailers said, go see David and Zeus. He'll pick it up, he'll do it. Go see David and Zeus. So we built that relationship where our customers trusted us, and in turn, they made sure when someone came to them, they referred them to us. Um, to give you a, I didn't get the chance to speak to everyone, so I probably didn't get a chance to speak to you, but um, I think all the people that are here today have something, um, and they all have said something that um, related to their particular product that's important. I think I need to spend a little more time with the actually using feedback on something that just caught me out there. Awesome. Honesty. That's integrity. Just talk about. Wait, wait, one more thing. Integrity and honesty. Don't forget those things. And give back. That's the most important thing. It's not about the money, because guess what? Whatever we have today, we don't take it with us. So do the right thing when you're out there. Uh, you can give it to me now. <laughs> wait a second. I got that one. <laughs> So I have the luxury of knowing uh, a few of the presenting companies in tonight, and um, just got to be Paul, just really impressed with them. A couple of them that I know we either do business with or we have some partnership with, and I think it's the shameless bet, folks. Uh, I met him in a bit. I was immediately impressed both with what they're doing with the business, the product, they left an impression, I think it's important, whether it's potentially with the customer or with your, your end customers. Leah, I met Leah and her partner from Dick. Um, came out of the conversations with them, really impressed with the vision of where they're going, who they are the people. Erica, um, amazing amount of passion about what she's trying to do and bring kind of an innovative technology to the world of rescuing animals, which is kind of core to what we do. And for us as a business, of everything we've done, I think one of the things we're most proud of as founders is the customer rating we have. And, and I've stolen John's phrase as a very good fan sometimes. Uh, we set out day one, I think it was a strategic goal what we're doing, and it sounds simple, but a lot of companies just don't do it well. And, and I do believe that every interaction you have with your customer is about building trust and building raving fans that in today's world of social proof is so important. Yeah. Courtney. Um, well, I just wanted to say a couple things. One, when we were in New York, we met people in here, and I'm hearing everybody going direct to consumer, but I'm also hearing, well, I'm talking to Petco, I'm talking to Chewy, I'm talking. So, one, know your distribution strategy and know it well, because you need to understand if you get into one, one channel, somebody else might not let you into another one. So make sure you're very clear, just because you're going to consumer, that can actually screw up any relationship you have with your distributor, with your large retailer, with your mid-sized retailer. One of the things at WPA is we really support independent retailers. So I, I know a lot of people understand, oh, I don't want to be in one or two stock stores. But do not underestimate the power of actually utilizing them as a completely different element of fundraising, if you will. You can actually, rather than going out and funding yourself, going out and asking for funding, you can go to a certain amount of retailers and get orders, and then all of a sudden now you don't have to raise money to go produce your product. So use them as a testing ground and not use them in a bad way. Use them as your partner. Use, do not forget that there are other partners out there and there are other channels, but know your distribution strategy. David, don't put this one to ask you a question next. Um, so several of the people that came up talked about that they they want to partner, you know. So as a startup grows, they want to partner. Obviously, you guys are a huge company, great leader in the industry. Um, you you also look at a lot of partnership deals because of your role on, on the legal side. Can you talk a little bit about what a, a founder should expect when they try to partner with a big company or with anybody? So what would a partner expect when they look to, to partner with us? A couple things. First, we want to look at the idea, right? We want to understand that the idea is relevant for pets and the consumers. And what I thought was really neat when I was walking around and looking and talking to all people before this and getting their ideas, six totally different ideas, totally unrelated. I work for the largest pet company in North America, and we're not working on any of these, right? So 
think about that. We see every kind of possible pet idea, and you guys came up with six different ones that we haven't touched, right? All different angles, even stuff that might overlap a little bit, whether it's a pet tree, you're looking at pet treats differently than we are, whether it's pet adoption, you're taking a different approach to pet adoption than we are. So for us, we want to look at ideas that are different than you. And I'm impressed that you come to a setting like this not knowing what we want to see, and see six totally different new ideas. And then we want to meet the people. What we found is the people matter a lot, right? The idea is only as good as the person executing it, and whether the entrepreneur has passion behind it, whether they understand what they're getting into, whether they understand when they want money, what they're trying to do with it, what the priorities are, right? I mean, prioritization is a really big deal. Cash is king for entrepreneurs. You have to raise cash, generate cash, and maintain cash. So understanding why you're generating cash and what you intend to use it, that's something we'll look at a lot. Right? So as I see it, I want to understand the ideas. I want to know that the ideas we think matter to consumers, matter to pets. I want ideas that are that the big companies aren't already executing, or if you're executing, you're executing differently. I want to know the people that are executing understand what, why, what they want to do with them. They can articulate that vision. What happened up here with all six of them coming up and explaining it so succinctly was great. That doesn't always happen, trust me. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thanks, David. Um, you can pass the microphone down here. Um, I want to ask Courtney a question. You know, we've seen, so we had, uh, we've got a great mix of companies, and this is kind of what we see in the mega innovation prize, too. But uh, a lot of these companies are not necessarily selling services or products directly like you would expect to see in a pet store. So we're seeing like uh, Dig and, uh, and uh, you know, what Mutt Jackson is doing. Can you talk a little bit about how the pet industry is evolving to include services and, um, and those kinds of things more than just products? Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the benefits as a trade show company, and I come from a, a trade show background, so I have different segments of fashion and gifts and home and living. And, but it's very rare that somebody has an opportunity that we have a platform where we know what's going on six months, 12 months out, because we have access to thousands of databases of distributor manufacturers and thousands of retailers. And because we have consumer, we have thousands of consumer, uh, consumer uh, outreach. So we have a pulse of what's going on in the market. And obviously, services is the one way that retailers are trying to drive traffic experiential as well. It's all about the experience, whether it's an amazing dog wash or whatever it is. But services are next best growing outside of tech, CBD oil, and direct-to-consumer. Services are the fastest growing in the um, segment in, in the pet industry. Just curious Experiential. On, yeah, I'm just curious on the panelists, how many of you guys are pet parents? So pretty easy. Everybody? Sean and David, are you guys pet parents? What? You have dogs and cats at home? You guys have pets? I have, I have uh, a closed ecosystem of shrimp in my office. Awesome. There you go. So I'm just curious, what, you know, speaking as a consumer and you know, from somebody as an expert in the industry, what have you seen that's been kind of interesting? And, you know, each of you, if you could just like, what have you seen that's been something that you didn't think you would spend money on um, and now you're spending money on? First of all, I want to mention I am a very happy Pup Joy customer. Okay. Uh, for my mother and her dog, they get the box uh, uh, every month. Uh, her dog, Kathy, loves it, so that's good news. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. This is, this is super fun and fascinating for me to be sitting here in something that's out of my own normal technology discussions I'm having. It's almost like the synapses are firing. Almost when we, a couple of thoughts that are in my head. First, I get asked to invest in a lot of companies. I want to talk to you guys for a second because I'm sure that you guys want cash, you want investment at some point, wherever you're on your, your journey. I have five questions that I really evaluate and I ask entrepreneurs to come to me. And I'm at the C stage level um, of organizations. And the first question I ask is, tell me the problem in the world that you're solving. Okay? Explain that to me. Secondly, tell me how big the problem is in the world that you solve. And three, explain to me how the solution that you've created is at least 50% better than the current solution that's currently in place. Those are my three big questions. Then I move to, what's something about your team? How do I feel about the person or the executive team or anything like that? And the fifth question is just about price 
relative to the opportunity and whether that makes any sense. Okay, so just that's the easiest way to think about talking to an investor. Um, your industry is so fascinating because the pet ownership, if I understand this right, is growing through the roof right now. In fact, it's really funny. I talk about this a lot. 20 years ago, you know, single women did not have pets in the home. Now it's got to be like it feels to be like 70 percent of them have a dog or some pet somewhere running around. They've all got to go home, take care of it. You know, it's very disruptive to dating, uh, just in general. That's why I don't know what <laughs> What's that? <laughs> However, like I'm just sitting here, I'm thinking about it. It's like, what are the big problems, right? So I'm gonna just throw this idea out there. Y'all can take it or not take it. Not, I'm gonna go start a company and do this. You know how much remorse everyone in this world has for leaving their pet at home alone? The level of remorse and feeling shitty about yourself all day long is off the charts and the anxiety that you have. That to me is probably the biggest problem right now almost in the pet industry. How do we fix that? You know, and I'm like, in my mind, like for half a second, like, can I create like dog robots? I could actually go play with my dog throughout the day. By the way, the, uh, the, the mats that the dog, I mean, that's the first problem, you know, the peeing and pooping all over your place. That's number one problem. Once you move beyond that, then we move to the psychology of our pet that we have. How can we actually improve that overall? Um, I don't know if that made any sense, but I don't know that was what was going on on, on this earth. Well, okay. Maybe I'm going to ask you to try to speak, you know, to talk a little bit about, you know, what you know. I mean, I know it's not your formal role, but you certainly see a lot of that. What's, you know, what's the expectation of the pet family and how that's changed and why that's kind of an opportunity for entrepreneurs? Yeah, so uh, if I think the biggest thing that's changed in the look at opportunities is, is moving beyond kibble, right? So for the last, 10 or 15 years, we've tried to say, there's only so much you can do with kibble, so this is, you can do with what you say about kibble, including the kibble, that's been the focus. It is. And it is. It was very fancy. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're moving on, I think, as you said, pet care is really deep in the services side. It's getting the, how do you address the pet being home alone? How do you get closer to that? And then at the same time, we've got this whole data revolution, and this whole internet of things, and all these technologies converging together. So you say, what's the big trend? What are you looking for? What's different? These kind of technologies, how do you use data to interact with the pet and the pet parent a lot differently? And how's the best way to maximize that? And whether the data is whether the data is coming from a from a pet dating service, or whether it's coming from a smart home or a leash or collar, these are all things that potentially allow the owner, the pet marketer or manufacturer, the pet itself to all be better served. So we don't I think I don't think we have all the answers to this, but I do know that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to improve the life, and I think it's a good commercial opportunity as well. But I would say, if you're into that space, and I think in some ways all of you are touching that space, whether you're going direct to consumer, whether you're going to the vet channel, which is generating a whole lot of different data, you're all touching on that space. But it's to figure out what, what differentiates you. We probably talked to 25 different smart collars or activity collars. And the first thing I want to know is why is it different? than the last 22 I just talked to, right? Is it because you're coming to the price point that's different? Is it because you have three or four incremental new technologies that no one else has? I'll help explain that. So there's a couple different things there, but I want you all to think about how does your product help change that direct interaction with the patent consumer, and what data you generate can do that, and then what differentiates your product from others that you're trying to consume. And it's a very good comment on that. First of all, you are all entrepreneurs. You signed up for what, in my opinion, the hardest thing in the world you're ever going to do in your life. Um, you know, the phrase that we always say is that entrepreneurs choose to work 100 hours for themselves so they don't have to work 40 hours for someone else. Okay? Now, I'm, whatever, 16, 17 years in this business. We've raised, you know, almost $55 million for, you know, a rather large company inside of our sector. I was up till 3.30 in the morning last night, sitting here in the office, working on a presentation to talk to a new private equity round coming up that I had to give at 9 o'clock this morning. All right? It's not an easy life, just in general. We need to understand that. Um, but to what David, right? Okay, thank you. Um, to what David said, and it was so great in the private equity meeting that I had today, 
you've got, you can't be me too. When I talk to our company, does anybody get out of bed in the morning and go, oh, I want to be number two. <laughs> you know, I want to be number three in this industry. I want to be, no, no. Like your goal is to be number one specifically in whatever you choose to do. Now the question is, how are you going to actually define your segment and become number one in that segment and create differentiation? We have a history in this company that I was proud to talk to about looking for blue ocean opportunities. My goal wasn't to be number number two or number three in our, 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 our industry. Dustin's goal isn't to be number one in, in shipping um, you know, pet supplies and pet food and whatever the you know stuff that he's doing. The goal is to be number one. And you're always gonna have competition. And if you stick it out, work your ass off, there's a great chance you're gonna succeed in that. Thanks. Thanks. I'm gonna um, ask Dustin to take the next question here. Um, a lot of people talked about data. You know, you guys had a subscription box. One of the things that was intriguing the first time we talked to you was that it's not just about serving a great, serving a great experience of the subscription box, but talk a little bit about data, and then I'd like you to pass it on to David Levy and talk a little bit about what you see as the role of data in the pet industry as well. And uh, by the way, for the people in the audience, if you have questions, we're, we're going to be wrapping up here in a few minutes. If you have a question that you'd like me to ask, please pass it forward, OK? So we're going to take one step back like Sean was talking about there a little bit, and I promise I'll have the bigger question. So I think for all of us, regardless of where, where you're in the sector, whether you're in the services side, product, whether you're direct to consumer, or whether you're tech heavy, the world, the world of us as consumers, the way we buy things change. My guess is a lot of you drove here in an Uber. That means this long ago. It's, it's reinvented the way that especially urban commuters travel. Netflix changes the way we, it changed the way we consume content. Very quickly. It's even a verb. And you've got a lot of services that are coming up that are anchored on tapping into those type of buying behaviors and conveniences that play into everything we're doing. The pet industry at times might be a little bit behind, but it's not bad for you. So, data. I think for most companies, especially companies starting in the industry, data is huge. Understand your customer, being intelligent about what you do with that, being respectful around how you gather that and use that information is critical for companies to see you do that. Same question? Yeah. How do you? Well, for the um, areas that I'm involved with, we look at the forward facing. What, what are the customers buying? And I think someone said it earlier uh, the fastest growing segments is the small breed. Um, and that's correct. So we look at all the data, but we get data from the side of investment. We get it from Petco, PetSmart, the massive stores. We have to literally break that down to know who to market to. So startups, like it was already said, take the data, use it safely. And when you're out there trying to promote yourself, don't constantly sell, sell, sell. Give some content, give good information. Give them something that they can use it's the old saying, it's like one, two, three, and then maybe a sales pitch. Don't constantly sell yourself because you won't get, you won't get real honest customers, all right? Yeah, thank you. David Norkowitz, um, let's talk about data a little bit here. Do you, can you, you know, from a larger company, you know, you guys have rare exposure with data, so you're probably going to be more cautious about it. Can you talk a little bit about how to think about data, you know? Well, the cautious part is making sure that we're meeting all the privacy requirements and that we're transparent with consumers because big companies have significant risk there, right? We've seen Target and others have really bad catastrophic events there. So for big companies, that's a, that's a must-have. But when I think of data, what's really changed is if five or 10 years ago, data meant we were a 35 to 45-year-old female, made $150,000 and lived in a city, and then we figure out how we market to that way, right? Now data can mean I get down to the, the layer of your pet. I know what kind of pet you have, how many pets you have, how often, how often you walk your pet, right? Whether you date with your pet, how often your pet, you know, goes to the water bowl. I want to know whether you get another pet, and all of that translates into relevant things for big companies or for small companies, and that's what's changed. And we're just on the beginning of this curve, but I think we know it's important, and you all know it's important. And for us, that's what I think is the big opportunity to tap into. We're a pet food company, we're a pet litter company, that's not going to change. But the opportunity of data and services that go around it, there's an opportunity to monetize that in and of itself. There's also an opportunity to take that and be a better pet food company, or be a better pet litter company, or a better pet care company. And hopefully that all can.
cascades down the benefits for the path. So, Dan, I don't know if I answered your question exactly, but that's how I think we're really thinking about it. What worked five or 10 years ago, getting Nielsen data, getting retail data, it's not the data we're talking about today. So you're talking about a much deeper understanding, and it's a, and it's a triple level of trust as well, right? Yeah. So um, we're, 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 um, we're trying to keep this recording a little bit short. We're gonna actually have a chance for a closing thought. I'm just gonna ask each of the panelists to, uh, to uh, and, and David, if you can start um, with it. Which, what do you think is gonna be interesting to see in the next year? What's gonna happen in the near term in the pet industry? And what do you see as something more long term? And if you don't have a big sense of that as a panelist, because you might, your own, your own pet might be shrimp, um, you know, what do you think is compelling about the industry? So let's uh, let's kind of close with something that's kind of a little bit forward thinking and thinking about big potential here. So I think what's changed on the industry is all the time about the data and the dot com model. So for many decades, Marina was a leading company selling through grocery, mass merchandisers, and pet specialty stores. And that world's changed. Whether it's different businesses going direct whether it's different concepts, whether it's going even with the Amazon or Chewy, wherever it might be, the world that we knew for 50, 60 years is no longer the world today. So anyone who can really leverage that opportunity, of these new channels, these new consumers, these new past to consumers, I think has an ability to compete. And sitting here as a representative of Karina, we'd like to meet as many of these entrepreneurs with as many ideas and see how we can, can help bring the best ideas to life. Um, I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> something neat on the near term horizon and something long term for pet. I'm going to take it in a different direction. You guys can figure that out. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to respond to what David said. Because I thought I, I thought it was so cool to hear. Now, and, and I say this in a very loving and, and caring manner. Okay? Big corporations are run by the wares. <laughs> okay? And David has it all back. And that isn't, that's not a bad thing. That's their, their job is to protect and ensure nobody gets into hot water and the brand doesn't get into hot water and they don't do anything and so they stay very far and so on. Entrepreneurs are the opposite. Yeah. Okay, you've got to adopt the opposite mindset. It's why innovation takes place in this world. It's because we as entrepreneurs are willing to push the boundaries of what's considered acceptable and not acceptable. Now, I agree that you've got to stay within legal boundaries of data and collection, but what that means to Purina and what that means to you are very different concepts, okay? So don't be afraid to push those boundaries. Secondly, little pro tip, uh, depending upon where you're at, I didn't pay taxes for like four years. I didn't have the money to pay taxes. I didn't have the cash. Here's the deal, I, I, when I started the center, I went into $70,000 in uh, personal uh, debt, credit card debt, over 25% interest. By the way, credit card debt, unsecured personal loans. It was as close to loan sharks for the brand name that you could possibly find. Now, I looked at it. You know what happens if you don't pay your taxes? You have to pay a penalty. You know what that penalty is? It's like 8%. I couldn't borrow money at 8%. So for, I'm just like, you know, nothing wrong with flouting the lines and maybe doing things people would consider acceptable, but it's about survival in the early days. That's my advice. I think you just told them those the person who gave them. This is not legal advice. No, no, we, we, I think we fully agree. <laughs> that's that's Sean, why we like that for no term. No, 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 no. I paid them eventually. <laughs> so, Jamie. I was, yeah. I was happy to pay the penalty, too. Trust me, I'm 8% done. Signed it up all day long. <laughs> Jamie, what's something exciting to see in the industry, near term and long term? My dogs and cats are paying taxes. Is that what you said? Um, so I think that the conversation is going to change. And I don't mean the conversation of entrepreneurship, products, services. I think there's going to be a dialogue change around what and who pets are from a very pure core concept, behaviorally speaking. Um, I think that in the, in the last, let's say the last 10 years, there's been a, a, uh, a departure from understanding uh, what a dog needs behaviorally to be, to be happy and to be uh, sound and of mind. And I think that there's been a, a rash of products recently, and again, the last 10 years, that haven't really been in line or on par with what a dog really needs on its core level. And I've seen some stuff.
stuff recently, a little bit of time, that really is more, um, more thoughtful or more mindful about what pets need to thrive. So I think that um, little by little, if I have anything to do with it, of course, being in the education space, that we can start having these conversations so we can help entrepreneurship, we can help entrepreneurs and product development and folks that are in that space think more about who a dog or a cat or a bird or a shrimp, or a shrimp, or a very listen, I have a rat, by the way, we have a pet rat, I think about her all the time, her name is Sarah, what makes her tick, what does she need to thrive, what are the products and food and things, so that's where I think things are going to start to shift, is that we're going to start to have, again, it's going to be slow, people are anthropomorphic, right, that you guys know what anthropomorphizing is, is assigning human qualities to our pets, you know, he's happy, he's sad, you know, all these sort of things, he's mad at me, all of that sort of thing. And that can actually be helpful to Sean's part about, you know, leaving dogs at home, what can we do to change that? But it can also be pretty destructive if we're not um, looking at it kind of from a 360 perspective and paying attention to, to the true uh, behavioral drivers. So, yeah, so make sure you guys are making products for the pet. Thanks. So I'll follow up on that with, uh, I think there's going to be more transparency. I think as people get educated and go online and go more than just one site, they're going to start educating themselves about ingredients, how things work, open education. Um, and I think the biggest thing that's going to happen is tech. All you hear about is tech, 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 tech. And uh, people want that interaction with their pet. People feel bad when they're not at home with their pet. Uh, you had, what, I think uh, there was another company that was here last year that had a toy that was interactive. I'm an investor in a company that has a dog feeder, um, treater, tech's gonna go big. And then, uh, as it was said earlier, CBD oil, medical marijuana, hemp-based CBD, it's gonna go until the FDA uh, decides to commit it and uh, put the clamps down on it. Um, that's about it. That's good. So, I think great comments, and I don't want to be repetitive with anything you said. So what we're talking about, new models of shoemaking hands-on that didn't have, you know, didn't exist, but have the dominance they do today for distribution. New products like CBD oil. I think one thing for anybody starting out in the space, don't forget, pet industry and pet buyers are no different than people buying their stuff. So there are major trends going on in buying behavior, whether that's online, convenience, uh, transparency, I think it's huge. Don't forget the consumers are in control more than they've ever been. Back to Sean's very first point about raving fans. Don't forget the roll up your sleeve and give a shit customer service. Because a lot of brands don't do it well in a lot of industries today. I think the ones that do stand out. Courtney. Um, I, I think I'm going to kind of go back to a little bit of what I talked about with distribution. I've helped a lot of brands uh, enter into the Chinese market. And a lot of times, especially within the fashion industry, uh, they would say, oh, well, I'm just going to launch on Tmall or on site called jdu.com and, and I would say okay well, would you ever recommend someone coming to the United States and launching their brand on Amazon and that's it right so just be careful as you're as you're moving down the line of going business B to C making sure that you're you're not using your e-commerce platforms as um you still have to drive people don't that yes, it's a great way to distribute your product. Yes, it's much easier than it used to be 10 years ago, but make sure you're not relying on that to, to drive the traffic. You still have to drive the traffic. And so again, it kind of goes back to your distribution strategy and make sure you get consumers and drive them to wherever you want them to go. You still have to get them to go somewhere. I want to follow up on that. One, one, yeah. one quick one on that. So we brought up Amazon. Own your own brand on Amazon. Do not sell Amazon. They do not, I, currently they don't honor Mac. Do yourself a favor, control your product, do brand registry, whatever you do, be very careful. Right. Trademark, trademark, trademark. <laughs> yeah, right, that's all. Um, so thanks everybody for our panelists. We have a big round of applause for our panelists. exciting startups here tonight. We have a few more minutes here tonight to interact with them. If you haven't had a chance to talk to them, uh, please do so. If you're one of those startups and you haven't had a chance to meet the other startups, make sure you meet them. We found that most of these events that people want to work and to work together and support each other. Um, final thing is for anybody watching, uh, for in the room or watching this, the, the industry only really works 
because these startups have sales and that they can grow. So make sure you're supporting these startups. Make sure you're supporting them with sales, you know, that you're buying their products, that you're recommending them to others when you have a great experience. Tell them about it and spread that word. And when you have an experience that could be better, make sure you talk to that startup so they know because they don't get better unless we can grow. Sean wants the mic. Sean wants the mic. Of course we can. <laughs> no, I, I thought we were in the trust tree. <laughs> I didn't realize that there were like people on the internet. It's okay. I, I just thought we were in the trust tree. That's it. I didn't know that. Let's go B. Well, you know, we, we, stream we, won't, we won't put it up on YouTube until we take a look at everything he said. <laughs> no, it's been a great conversation. It's uh, it's just going to have a great company or our here. It's a great ecosystem. Big round of applause for everybody. Make sure you please. Uh, Thank you.